My name is Sverre Molland and I'm a lecturer in Anthropology and Development Studies here at ANU and I'm joined with my colleague John McCarthy to discuss some of his uh, recent research in Acha in the context of uh, humanitarian assistance from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami and uh, consider some of the impacts that had in the long run 10 years after. Uh, John, can you just talk a little bit about uh, some of the research you've done in Aceh? Uh, well, I lived in on the west coast of Aceh for about a year during the late 1990s when I was doing my PhD research. And after this time, of course, we had the, um, the guerrilla war in Aceh between the Aceh Madeka, the Aceh Freedom Movement, and the Indonesian government. So I didn't go back for several years. And then, of course, we had the tsunami. And um, I missed the tsunami mm. intervention. I volunteered with various agencies as one of the few people, I guess, in Australia who'd lived on the west coast of Arche, but um, nobody mm. took up my offer to go as a volunteer. Um, mm. So I always said to all, all the people that I met who were working in Arche in the post-tsunami period that I would go back there after they'd all gone back home. And that's what I did. So I went mm. back about eight years after tsunami to, to look at what had been the impact of all these um, extensive development projects mm. along the west coast which i'd lived in uh about over 10 years previously oh that's rather interesting so in some ways it's like you have done an archaeology of humanitarian assistance in a way you've gone back nearly a decade after after the indian ocean tsunami uh yes it was quite on the one side quite confronting to go back to these um communities mm. I, the communities i went back to visit weren't the ones that i'd lived in previously because through some some twist of fate the part of the coast that I lived on had missed the tsunami but further along mm. um, you know an enormous number of people there had been killed so it was very sad to go and visit these communities but at the same time it was kind of fascinating because you walk along the village road and you would see an abandoned building that had been constructed during the tsunami period or you'd see a, a sign outside a building saying what it was for but often it was was no longer being used or people would tell you about what happened at a particular mm. time about some cooperative that once existed there. And of course, now you could just see the sign saying that there was a cooperative there. So, And also there were a mm. lot of buildings that had been destroyed in the tsunami that were kind of sitting there like Roman ruins or across the landscape, which was mm. quite confronting to see. Mm. So when you went back about eight years after the Indian Ocean tsunami, so as you just said, um, a lot of sort of material differences, if you like, and sort of ruins, if you like, of, of, of previous um, social organization and so forth. Um, can you say a little bit more about, or I suppose one thing that I'm, I'm curious about is, is um, you know, you had all this enormous humanitarian uh, effort, uh, you know, just after, in the immediate aftermath of the, the, the tsunami. Um, going back eight years after, what did you find? What did, what did that humanitarian assistance look like? And also, also if you can talk a little bit about the type of humanitarian assistance that was given in those communities uh, in the aftermath of the tsunami. Um, well, it's a huge topic. There's a whole library of papers and books mm. written about it. But because the post-tsunami intervention in Aceh is arguably one of the biggest aid interventions in history, they spent about... $6.7 billion mm. on this intervention. <clears throat> so there were all sorts of things that they did. And I w must say some of the interventions were very mm. successful in the sense that they did a lot of um, interventions immediately after tsunami, which were incredibly successful in, in terms of stabilizing people's food security, um, mm. intervening m medically. At that, that stage this, of the intervention was incredibly successful. Um, and they did a lot of very good things in terms of rebuilding roads, beautiful roads along the west coast of Arche. Rebuilding rice paddies in some areas have been very mm, well done. Mm. Beautiful bridges, wonderful clinics. I could show you photos of all these beautiful buildings. Mm, mm. So on that level, in terms of building assets, mm. um, it was incredibly successful. Of course, because they had so much money to spend and they had a short window to spend it in because mm. if you remember back at that time, a lot of agencies were being criticised for not spending their money. So they had That's to spend... Right, yes their money as quickly as possible. So as you walked around the village, you would come across um, what one World Bank guy said to me were white elephants. These things that had been built in incredible rush because somebody had said the village needed it. Mm. And um, for instance, just to give you an example, in one of the villages I visited, there was kind of a, um, a uh, health clinic 
and I think there was only someone from the health, the district health service coming once a month. So mm. most of the time the building was empty. There was another building um, built for the women's association in the village, which was basically used as a storehouse. It was a beautiful building. So you meet all <laughs> these sorts of, and also you would find mm. these ghost villages where they would rebuilt a whole village, um, but in the wrong place. They built it sort of where people didn't want to live. And so mm. nobody would move into it. Uh, so they had to rebuild the village somewhere else. And so you, you'd find this whole place with 30 or 40 houses were completely in ruins mm. because uh, they'd, they'd been built but never occupied and someone had gone mm. in there and trashed them. Uh, mm. So mm. all kinds of different things across the landscape. Mm. Mm. So <clears throat> obviously there must have been a lot of challenges with, with that. Uh, uh, on the one hand, you have that immediate response, right? Uh, but then you get that more long-term sort of, you know, post-tsunami reconstruction phase etc and, and you already pointed out a few problems with that uh, obviously you know the pressure to spend money quick uh, the fact that a lot of agencies come in at the same time and as you say short window of opportunity to to deliver aid um, they are obvious challenges and perhaps help to explain some of the problems to some extent but uh, could you say a little bit more about uh, you know what were some of the reasons for why some of these interventions perhaps in the more long term um, uh, had challenges or, or perhaps even failed okay um of course mm. you know not to rubbish people's efforts a lot of people went mm. in there with a great deal of goodwill <coughs> and tried to do the right thing and there was you know like mm. i said there were quite a degree of success particularly around giving people assets people who lost everything they gave them assets they gave them um, they rebuilt their houses they uh, gave them mm. cattle. They, if people had a, a warung, a kind of little village mm, shop, yeah. they would give them capital to reopen their shop. Mm. And um, some people, when I came back eight years later, still had these assets and were continuing to, to live off them. So mm. on that level, it was very successful. What they were less successful, uh, uh, they were much less successful mm. in helping people rebuild their livelihoods. Now, the reasons for this are quite complex. Mm. And people told me in the post-tsunami <coughs> period, if you were a villager, everyone wanted to do participatory development. So what would happen was FAO or Oxfam or Save the Children would come into the village and would try and do participation. So they would get mm. people to come along and come to a community meeting. So because <coughs> mm. you remember there's 180 NGOs trying to spend $6.7 billion. Of course, not all of this is NGO money, but mm. this was a total amount of money. So there was just a flood of NGOs. Um, People in Aceh, <coughs> excuse me, talked mm. about three tsunamis. The actual tsunami, when the water hit the coast, then the aid tsunami, when the $6.7 billion started coming mm. in, and then the third tsunami was when the money all left because they had a window to spend all this money. Mm. So during the period when the aid tsunami was flowing, uh, someone in the village mm. could, today they would get paid to go to the Oxfam participatory rural development project mm -hmm. and sit around discussing what the mm -hmm. village needed and tomorrow they might go to the FAO one the day after it might be the Red Cross so villages could earn a living just going to all these community participation meetings which meant that there was no incentive for them to go back into their rice paddy or to start fishing again they could just live off the mm -hmm. aid money and this is what many of them did for up to seven six uh, five, six, seven years. They just lived oh, off wow. for several years, uh, yeah. participating mm. in all these different mm. projects. And they also got um, money for work. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would get their money for work. But and this idea was that they would then go back to their rice paddy mm. and f they get paid a, an income to actually mm. rebuild their rice paddy or rebuild their livelihood. But you've got to remember that in many of these villages, up to 50% of people had died, even more in some villages. So you might have the only person left in a household might be the, the male, the, the male head mm -hmm. of the household. Uh, so these men, these people were very traumatized. So they were also very depressed, as you would imagine. So mm -hmm. in many cases, they didn't really consider rebuilding their livelihoods for several years until they mm -hmm. remarried or somehow reconstituted their, their livelihoods. And mm -hmm. it was also very sad. If you went around the village, you would meet people who were obviously so traumatized that they never mm -hmm. really recovered from the tsunami. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's quite confronting to actually go into those sorts of landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, so people, if you ask villagers about what happened, mm -hmm. um, now I should say one key point here is mm -hmm. we did a 
a survey to try and work out what the level of vulnerability was. And we, class we used this FAO classification of food security. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a <coughs> kind of survey you do during the, what Indonesians call the Pacek click, the hunger season. In a rice producing area, there was usually a critical time, but just before the harvest, when the product from the last harvest have run out and they mm. still haven't harvested the next harvest. So it's a period when they ran out of rice. Now, if they've got good livelihoods, they, they've got other forms of income, which will cover this period. Mm. What we found in the two villages where we're up to the, this survey, and it was incredibly time consuming mm -hmm. to do this kind of survey, we found that up to 50% of villages had various degrees of vulnerability, by which I mean there was, mm. I think, about 10% of villages that were worried about running mm. out of food, but then there was probably about between 30 or 40% of villages that were cutting back on food to some degree. People weren't starving, but mm. they were altering what they would eat. So in Aceh, what people typically eat is they put, um, for instance, a, a family might put four cups of rice into the rice, um, mm. into the saucepan each day to cook mm. for the household. But say during this hunger season, they might cut down to two cups of rice. Or instead of, usually along the coast here, they would eat rice and they would eat fish and they would eat vegetables. So instead of having fish every day, they might only be having fish once or twice a week. Mm. So what we mm. found there was about 30 or 40% of households were at that level of vulnerability. Mm. They were cutting back on their food during the hunger season because their mm. livelihoods hadn't really been reconstructed. Right. This is despite mm. $6.7 billion of aid being spent. Mm. So this is, this is a, the big question. How could we have such an intervention with such goodwill and such mm. uh, a good intention to uh, what the aid agencies said was to build back better. Mm. And then we have this level of vulnerability existing mm. in these villages. Mm. Seems to me to be a key sort of paradox. And, and I suppose you can see this in all the types of humanitarian context. The, the build back better slogan, that was also something that was used in, in Haiti as well, for example, right? And uh, now I don't want to start talking about Haiti right now, but you know, there are similar type of challenges uh, in, in different contexts. Uh, just back to, you mentioned um, this idea of participation and so one thing that uh, you talk about in one of your papers on this, uh, which I thought was really, really interesting, is this idea of social capital. Uh, I mean, social capital has been written about extensively, both in academic literature, uh, but also in aid, aid literature as well. But what is interesting in this case, I think, is that you, you do look at this in the context of uh, the long-term aftermath of a humanitarian intervention, essentially. Uh, uh, can you say a little bit more about uh, social capital in this particular context and why it's important? Um, okay, so in lay terms, the idea of social capital is that the social networks and relationships that we have in a particular place are the key mm. to economic development in that place. So the idea here is that um, if Arche is going to redevelop, mm. these social relationships mm. and social networks are the key to it redeveloping. Now, the World Bank did a survey of Arche where they, um, they concluded that Arche had very high levels mm. of social capital. So the idea was, and this is an idea found across the development literature, um, to build back better, the Archene should be in the key decision-making role. So the idea was that um, decisions about w where things should be rebuilt or how they should be rebuilt would be put to the community. Mm. Uh, so what would happen was in these community development processes, the um, community would be invited to a meeting and they'd be engaged in decision making about um, you know, where things should be rebuilt or how the money should mm. be sp spent or what was the most immediate need. Now the problem was, um, that um, in Arche we'd had a, a war for mm. uh, for several years between a, a guerrilla movement that was in the hills <coughs> and the um, and the government, the military, mm. and so villages had been stuck in the middle between these two warring parties, really. Mm. Um, so what had happened was um, during this period the economy had really fallen apart at the village level. And also, to a large degree, trust had broken down between villages because um, they were all afraid mm. of becoming a victim from either side. And mm. so they, they mm. didn't know who they could trust. Mm. Um, and the other thing that happened was that because 
when the development agencies came into the area, they all tried to contact the local leaders. Mm. And of course, the local leaders had their own networks. Mm. Um, and some, if you were a local leader in a village, you would have all mm. the people in the village you're close to. And then there would be some people that you're less close to or you mm. didn't really trust. So when Oxfam came to talk to you, for instance, you would tend to mobilize your networks mm. and you would try and get aid to work in a way that, well, could prove to Oxfam that you are a good leader, but it would also lead to good outcomes for all your networks. So what happened mm. was this created a lot of jealousy in the village. So if I'm not part of your network and mm. I don't get access to all this aid, I start hating you. And so mm. then when you call a village meeting, I won't come along or mm. I feel just bitter and twisted about it. And mm. so this is what tended to happen. Th through these, um, these kind of processes, often, if they weren't done very skillfully, they would mm. split the community. And also, maybe you were close with Oxfam, but I was close with Save the Children. And somebody mm. else was close with the Red Cross. So each of the different agencies might be competing for the same person or different people might be jockeying for position uh, because mm, if you get mm. you had this kind of mediating role with the agency mm. you got opportunity to help people you had opportunity to enhance your status and perhaps you might also get some mm. opportunities yourself for a good livelihood mm. for several years mm, so we had mm. this kind of process and one world bank guy that i spoke to during the course of the, the research mm, said mm. that this actually, this kind of process actually destroyed mm. collective action in the village. It wrecked social capital. So in mm. Indonesians have this tradition of what they call gotong royong, where they, were, for instance, would all come together to clean mm. the mosque or to fix up village facilities. Now, when I went back there, what I found was that they were hardly was hardly working at all anymore after the tsunami. Mm. Pe because mm. also people got used to the fact that you should be paid to do things. So mm. what happened was that when these um, development agencies tried to use social capital to rebuild, um, sometimes they came along with their participatory manual and said, well, we should have accountability, transparency, we should set up new forms of institutions that are working in a sort of modern way. And so they would set up new structures. Mm. And then there was this whole phenomena of, if you go up on the web, you'll see all these pictures of all these aid projects being handed mm. over to the Archonese. And there'll be a usually somebody cutting a ribbon or mm, doing something mm. like that. And there'll be all these smiling mm. people there. So I had a number of informants say, oh, yes, the project went really well until it was surrendered to us. And then after that, we no longer took part in it. We just went back to our own networks. Mm. So you find all these signposts around the village about different um, cooperatives or different sort of aid projects. And if you go mm. behind there, there's actually nothing operating there anymore because mm. after the project ended, um, nothing continued. People went back mm. to their existing networks, to their existing livelihoods. Now, the exception were we found mm. in the two sub districts we were in, and I think our, you know there would have been scores of projects in those two sub districts. Mm. We found about seven, five to seven. I can't remember exactly now. It's a couple of years ago since mm. I was doing this, but it was a, a, probably half a dozen successful mm. projects. Mm. So what, what made these projects successful? Why were they able to mobilize mm. social capital? Mm. So there's a number of key things, factors here. Uh, one of the things is that they didn't try to set up new structures. They tried to fit into the local context. And there was an element of serendipity here because they happened by chance to come across village leaders who had a great sense mm. of mm. authority, but also... Um, respect in the village. Mm. So these people were able to mobilize their authority to make people accountable and transparent for their activities. Mm. Um, I can yeah. elaborate a bit on that if you're interested. Yeah, no, definitely. So, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about that, I think, is is that it, it does, I suppose it poses some practical challenges from the point of view of aid organizations. How do you program for that sort of thing when serendipity is sort of, you know, part of what makes something work? But it seems to me to also, in a more maybe conceptual way, also to be interesting too, in the sense that, uh, again, if you, if you try to think about something like social capital as, as an analytic device to understand social relations and social practices, um, it becomes somewhat, um, uh, you know, it, it raises some interesting questions about how, you know, what does that mean, right? So, yeah, so, so perhaps a question then would be, um, Given that you have some, you know, success, if you like, uh, 
depending on particular community leaders. And again, back to this point about social capital, uh, what you also seem to be touching on here is that we are actually dealing with success being uh, contingent on hierarchical relations. And, you know, in, in many ways, uh, social capital is sort of this idea of horizontal relations in some respects, or somehow this idea that we have, you know, networks have somehow, or social networks have some sort of, um, there's a solidarity function, if you like, in that somehow. So, um, and again, if you want to talk about participation, uh, you know, again, how do you reconcile that with the fact that you need to target maybe community leaders uh, that can actually uh, exercise authority in order to have successful outcomes? Mm. So, um, so yeah, if you can maybe comment on that a little bit. I mean, to me, it seems to, to pose a larger question, uh, both in terms of what can aid uh, programs then do given those insights at the same time, what can we learn in terms of, you know, what are the broader implications of social capital? Okay, well, that's a quite an interesting point. Um, I think the the famous book by Putnam, he talks mm -hmm. about, he compares Northern Italy with, with uh, Southern Italy, and Southern mm -hmm. Italy has got what he describes as more dysfunctional forms of social capital because um, you might remember South Southern Italy is where the mafia operates. Mm -hmm. So we've got very... Um, powerful forces at work mm. there. And vertically, there's some very powerful sort of patrons, and horizontally, mm. there's kind of networks of reciprocity between mm. people. But we don't get the kind of associations which he saw to the as the key to development in um, in northern Italy. Now, mm. if you look at Arce, mm. what, what you find there is that uh, it's similar in that way. We've got usually mm. in the village, we've got. Um, 30 or 40 or even 50 percent of villages are sharecroppers which means they are mm. incredibly dependent on their landlords so what we have is a very dependent sort of social arrangement where um, a large number of people in the village are very much dependent on the key leaders in that village for mm. access to resources for borrowing money for mm. um, access to rice land these sorts of things so they can't afford to offend these people mm. at the mm. same time people are also very much dependent on their neighbors or their their family so they've got these kind of very tight horizontal networks but we don't find the kind of associations that mm. Putnam talked about in in northern Italy so what happens then is that when a development agency comes in they're really going to be working with these key people in the village mm. which mm. although we might talk about these participatory processes mm. it's very hard for villages to hold these village leaders accountable because they're also very dependent dependent on them in these kind of patron client contexts so that, yeah, that's, that's right. where it's very hard for it to work. I mean, the other, that's not saying that if you get a good patron, it mm. can work. So there's a tension there. You do a participatory process, it can be captured by these local big men, if you want to call them, or big women. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, if you get a good patron, you can have a very successful mm. project. So this is kind of the, the paradox of the social capital kind of mm. framing of it. But the other thing that some of the crit critiques of social capital and ideas and participatory mm -hmm. or, uh, <coughs> approaches or what they call now um, community driven development this is the idea that community should drive development one of the critiques of it is that we're making communities responsible for their own development yes that so we're saying mm. you've got capacities within your community and you should be up to drive the whole process Whereas in underdeveloped communities, that's going to be a problem. And mm. when we've had a tsunami and a civil war in an area, mm. a lot of villages aren't in this position to become what we might call participatory subjects. They're not mm. able to become the model participants of mm. the community-driven development sorts tends to assume because, well, they're mm. traumatized, they've lost half their family, um, mm. they're just interested in trying to, to get by mm. until they're in a better a state of mind so this is the reason i remember one villager saying to me oh i actually met a whole lot of villagers in a coffee shop one one night and we had a long chat mm. and they said they weren't bitter about how it had all worked out they didn't blame the aid agencies they they said well you know we were so traumatized or so upset by what mm. happened to us in the tsunami that it was only about after about eight years that we started thinking about the future mm. by eight years all the aid agencies had pulled out and they'd spent there's uh, what mm. I say 6.8 billion dollars mm. and it was too late so this was a was a kind of wistfulness 
amongst mm. uh, a lot of these people which who were now food insecure, many of them, mm. because um, their livelihoods hadn't been repaired. So mm. what are the implications for aid agencies? Mm. There's probably a couple of things here. I think mm. one of the things is that this window, this idea of spending money quickly, is really problematic. Yes. So the aid agencies are really... Um, they're accountable to their donors back home and people in Australia want to see the money dispersed quickly after a disaster. Mm. This is actually a problem. Mm. So the aid agencies aren't accountable locally. Mm. So there's incentives for them to spend their money as quickly as possible, but this is really a problem. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, if they trip over each other and don't make wise decisions, nobody in the donating, the donator, the donating community back mm. here in Australia is going to know, are they? So we, That's right, yes. So they produce these mm. very glossy reports mm. saying, you know, um, how successful their, their activities were. I'm not blaming them. It's a very hard mm. field of development that they're intervening in. Mm. Um, but it really needs to be rethought. The other thing is that I remember meeting um, one Archinese leader there who was quite bitter about it. He said, look, all the NGOs came in, they bypassed the government. Mm. So they mm. spent all their money through this community-driven development, but they didn't do much to rebuild mm. the state, which is probably a bit unfair because I know a lot of donors like OSAID, now mm. DFAD, did mm. spend a lot of money trying to help the Indonesian government. Mm, but that's right. To a large degree, he did have a valid point. That mm. They rushed in, they, um, they tried to get past the Indonesian government. So in the long term, after everybody's gone home, who is left? The community and the government and maybe some NGOs, but NGOs mm. don't have sustainable funding. So most of the NGOs that had emerged in the post-tsunami period were no longer operating when I was there. So mm. the question mm. is, over the longer term, helping the state to develop its mm. capacity to develop these areas and mm. um, creating more accountability and transparency and greater capacity in the state is really critical. So mm. I think we can go too far with the mm. social capital community-driven development Approach. It doesn't mean mm. we should throw it away altogether because mm. clearly we need to engage with local communities and get them involved in making decisions, but mm. we can't go too far with that. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much, John. A uh, very You're fascinating uh, um, discussion about your, your research in, in Archer. Thank okay. you. Um, and of course, the, the paper's available if anybody's interested in, in pursuing it. Yes, definitely. Uh, and that will, of course, go into some of these these issues in more detail, right. including this idea of social capital in a humanitarian post or post humanitarian context, if you like. And I also go yeah. through the six or seven projects that actually succeeded. So I, I don't want to be too negative yes. about all this. Mm. There was a large degree of success, but also a mm. very large degree of, of mm. um, not so successful outcomes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sophie. Thank you.